bless you. Have a seat. Let's dive in quick. Make the most of every minute we've got together. I'm going to bring a lot at you really fast, so buckle up. David Barton and I both get accused of talking about 90 words a minute with gust up to 350. <laughs> Forget 90. We're starting at 350. We might even go above that. So I love being with you. It is so good to see God's people coming together. Don't, didn't you miss that fellowship? Oh, my goodness, just to get to see each other, smile at each other, hug each other, pray for each other, lay hands on each other. Man, we need it so bad. I'm so thankful for what you're doing. You're really a beacon to others around the country. you got great pastors here willing to bring. You know, I mean, John and Becky, Jurgen and Leanne, they understand the importance of God's word applying to every part of our lives, not just these boxes we try to put Christ in, these boxes we try to put the word of God in. They understand the importance of even influencing government with the word of God. There are not enough churches in America doing that anymore. It used to be the role of the church. We used to even call pastors in the Revolutionary War the black-robed regiment. The British hated them because they were actually so engaged in the culture and they were teaching liberty to their flocks out of the Word of God. And then the pastors were grabbing the musket off the mantle and marching into battle with the people right out of their church. So the role of pastors and churches in American history has been huge. I want to bring it to maybe a point you may not expect, and that is when we think about our role as Christians in a free society like America, when we think about what it means to be a biblical citizen in the way that our nation works right now, I would suggest to you this morning that it actually goes back to the Great Commission, that when you think about the gospel itself, it is not just a one-time fire insurance salvation message, that the gospel, the actual uh, idea of the Great Commission is not just to share the story of Christ and what Christ has done for you, but actually to make disciples of all men. And so when you look at it, it's therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Now that means that there's nothing off limits. If you go and look at the teachings of Christ, if you take the Bible as a whole, there is no area of our culture that is off limits. And so he's given us a way to approach not just our finances and our family, but also our community, also our freedom itself. And so there's a biblical way uh, to do this. And, and, and if we would follow the biblical example, the whole culture would benefit from that. So if we, the church, are being salt and light and actually influencing what's happening outside then everybody else benefits as well because we're sowing in the right principles that produce good results. I, I'm going to give you a little bit of an analogy here because I think it fits. And, and um, I, I actually, we got blessed about a year and a half ago and got a new truck in our family. Okay, so this is our truck. It's a nice, beautiful Dodge Ram 1500. I, I say we um, somewhat uh, liberally because it's actually my wife's truck. But she does let me drive it every once in a while. Anyway, we're, we're, we're driving off the lot, and she's, of course, driving. And I open the glove box, and guess what I found in the glove box of this new truck? A manual. And the manual was written by the creator of that truck. The manual was instructions for us on how to operate that truck and get the most out of it, have it last the longest, perform at its best, all of those things. So we get this instruction manual written by the creator of the truck, and then as we're driving away from the parking lot, I'm looking at this manual, and I roll down the window and say, baby, this is our truck. Ain't nobody going to tell us how to live our truck. And I throw the manual out the window. And then we stop for gas, and we're going to get gasoline for this gasoline truck. But as we're pulling in, I say, you know, honey, I just kind of feel like a diesel today. So I think we should be a diesel. She's like, baby, we bought a gas truck. And I'm like, no, it's okay. I feel like a diesel today, so let's be a diesel truck today. And she says, maybe that manual we threw away might have said something about this. But, you know, we're going to try it anyway. We fill her up with diesel. How far out of that driveway do you think we're getting? In fact, right around the corner, it's going to turn into a Chevy and break down. That's probably, that's probably what's going to happen. So now that I've offended all the Chevy owners in the room, look, God has given us an instruction manual for life. The Bible teaches us how the brain works, how the body works, how relationships work, how society should work. All of that instruction is in there. And yet we too often as Americans want to say, nobody's going to tell me how to live. I'm going to have total freedom. I get to do anything and everything that I want. And we've redefined what freedom and liberty actually mean so that we can have a license for licentiousness rather than actually getting the best blessings of freedom by actually living within the boundaries that the author and the source of freedom actually gives us because he knows how we work and what's going to produce a good result. So we want to use the instruction manual. Noah Webster is one of our founding fathers. He said, all the miseries and evils which men suffer from vice, crime, ambition, injustice, oppression, slavery, and war 
proceed from their despising or neglecting the precepts contained in the Bible. Now, just that little short list there, there's some personal things in there that would cause us pain in our lives, but there's some cultural things in there as well, societal things. And he's saying both personally and culturally and as a society, if we follow the Bible, we can avoid that pain. We ignore the Bible and the precepts of the Bible. We're going to experience that pain in our culture. So let's specifically look at your role in America. If we're gonna teach people to obey all of Christ's commands, he said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and unto God what is God's. He said, well, Rick, how do I do that? How do I render? We don't have Caesar, right? But we do, actually. Who is Caesar in America? It's you. We the people. Government answers to you. Our system of government is different from the Roman Empire. When he uttered those words, that meant something different in terms of application. The principle was the same. But in terms of application, it was different because it was a different political and economic structure. In our political and economic structure, you are in charge. We the people are ultimately in charge. So if we're gonna render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, then we have to do our job as citizens. We literally have to say, okay, well, what does that mean to be we the people? How do I live out being Caesar in a free society? How do I, how do I take the Constitution and actually apply biblical principles to my society? Well, Charles Finney told us how simple this is. He was a speaker in the Second Great Awakening. Um, in fact, it's a picture of him preaching, but that's not, it looks like John Travolta in Staying Alive. He's just didn't have the white suit, but uh, he was pretty good, pretty good at that. Anyway, you know what inspired the movie now. Uh, he actually said the church must take right ground in regard to politics. Man, we could stop right there and say, well, wait a minute, Rick. What about separation of church and state? The church must take right ground in regard to politics. He's saying, yeah, politics, that's, that's just part of a religion in a country such as this. And Christians must do their duty to their country as a part of their duty to God. He said, God will bless or curse this nation according to the course Christians take in politics. Well, right there, think about it. He's just saying politics, that's just like family, work, relationships. It's all part of our religion because the Bible applies to everything. There's no secular spiritual split in this, in this idea of, a, of an instruction manual applying to our whole life. I mean, you would never walk away on Sunday morning driving home with your wife or your husband and saying, man, Pastor John was on fire today. I mean, that was such a great sermon about you know, how to treat your spouse, how to raise your kids. It was a really good sermon on, on being a good husband or father or, or wife or, or mother. But, you know, I wish we could apply it when we get home. But separation of home and church. Can't, can't, can't do it. You know, we, you've never driven away from this church and said, man, Pastor John was preaching so good on how to be a good servant leader, how to, how to be a good employer or a good employee, how to have good work ethic, how to treat people right. I wish I could apply it tomorrow at work, but separation of church and work. Why in the world do we allow ourselves to say separation of church and state? I can't apply God's word to how I'm going to vote on Tuesday or how I'm going to testify at the legislature, or how I'm going to influence the school board or the city council or all of these areas. There is no secular spiritual split. Psalms 24.1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Now, I'm just a country boy from Dripping Springs, Texas. Country boy interpretation of that is it's all his. Every bit of it. And if we are ignoring a part of it or we're pretending that a part of it doesn't belong to him, then we're ignoring the instruction manual and we're ignoring what he actually gave us. So we've got to take right ground in regard to politics. Well, how do we do that in our culture? You've been given, just like in the parable of the talents, you've been given a talent of freedom. You've been given the ability to influence who your leaders are. Now, first of all, recognize in the context of history, most people who ever lived on the planet did not have that right did not have that talent, that gift of freedom to be able to choose their leaders, to be able to choose what their government would look like. So first of all, it's just a blessing. It's incredible that we get to enjoy that, and we need to be thankful for it. But secondly, there's a responsibility that comes with it. There's a, you know, we love to talk about our rights. I got the right to do this and the right to do that, and I want freedom of speech and freedom of this and freedom of that. With every right comes a corresponding responsibility. We too often talk about the rights and don't talk about the responsibility that comes with it. It's just like that parable of talents. I mean, God's given you this gift of freedom. Are you going to be one of those two that he came back and said, well done, a good and faithful servant. You know, you've been faithful with a little bit. I'm going to give you even more to be responsible with. Are you going to be that one that buried the talent, hid the talent, maybe said, oh, I'm not voting. I'm not going to get involved. I can't make a difference or it's too risky or whatever. And then what did he say? Wicked and slothful servant. My friends, if we don't use our freedom, if we don't exercise this citizen duty, 
I believe we're being wicked and slothful servants. We're not, we're not doing the best that we can with what God has given us. He's blessed us with so much. So we've got to be engaged in this. In fact, right now and what's happening in our culture, I think this verse applies as well. Whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him it is sin. I think that, that is true with regard to our culture. I mean, we're dealing with a culture war right now of worldviews. There are competing worldviews. Some, some that say that life is not precious that you can take life in the womb up, up, to, up to literally to birth or even after birth. I mean, we're, we're talking about evil right now. And for us to stand back and say, I'm not gonna be involved, or, or for us to say, I'm gonna vote for a candidate that supports that kind of infanticide because the other candidate said something that offended me. Are we seriously gonna make moral equivalence of those two things? We've got... We've got to have discernment, right? We've got to have discernment, and there is evil in our world right now, and we have got to step up and have a voice of reason with that. Now, I gotta, I gotta sidetrack just a little bit, because as I say, be a good citizen and, and be involved in this, I, I used to go around and give this presentation over here that says, saving America begins with you. But right now, America's on trial. There's many of you that may be feeling, you may be worried, in your gut, you're wondering, is this system even worth saving? I mean, should I save? The American Constitution. Is the American value system good or bad? And, and there's a lot of things we could discuss today to, to, to answer that question. But again, I'm a country boy from Dripping Springs, so I'm just gonna make it really, really simple. We're gonna look at one basic, easy to analyze question. If you wanna know whether or not a nation is good or bad, whether or not a nation is worth saving, whether or not a nation's principles and values and system of political and economic structures is producing good results or bad results, very simple question to ask. Are people trying to get in, or are they trying to get out? Because if they're trying to get in, there must be a reason, right? If they're not fleeing to get out, there must be a reason. America has one out of every five immigrants on the planet. Now that's not illegal or illegal, I'm not distinguishing between those two. That means they are, you're living in a nation in which you were not born. There are more immigrants living in America than the second, third, fourth, and fifth nations combined. There's more immigrants living in America than the bottom 159 nations combined. That tells you right there, there is something about the American value system that's working pretty darn good, right? Doesn't mean we're perfect, absolutely not. Doesn't mean we're flawed, absolutely. Guess what, because America is still made up of Human beings, people, as, as one of my guys says, the joys of working with people, right? I mean, that is part of being in a society. We're going to have flaws, and we're going to have sinners, and we're going to have things like that. But the American dream is still real. Have you ever noticed that you don't hear that phrase with any, have you ever heard of the North Korean dream? <laughs> Anybody? No, I don't think I've ever, have you ever heard of the Cuban dream? Right, it doesn't happen in socialist or communist countries. The American dream is what the entire world looks to and says, that's the model. They've gotten the results. They've created a society that's a blessing. But right now, man, we hear it in our streets all over the nation saying, America's evil, America's bad, we need to destroy America. The Marxist philosophy that's being taught to tear down the American system is on purpose. It's part of what Karl Marx said 150 years ago. To divide, to, to destroy us, you have to divide us. You have to put black against white, rich against poor, uh, and, you know, country boys against the intellectuals of the Northeast. I mean, whatever you can come up with, you gotta come up with something that will divide us because they don't want us united. They don't want us coming behind these principles and saying, this works. So let me just speak to the elephant in the room, all right? Everybody looks at these guys and says, well, weren't they all racist slave owners? Why should we be proud of America? Why should we be proud of what we have at all? Uh, let me tell you, I've studied these guys for 30 years, and I discovered something in that study, an amazing thing. They were human, too. They were sinners, too. They did evil things, just like you and just like me. They were depraved just like us. And when you go back to 1776 and you look at the world, every nation had slavery. Black on black, black on white, white on black, white on white, yellow, red, you put it all in there. Every combination you can possibly think of. And believe it or not, three-fourths of the men you see in this picture were abolitionists, wanted to end slavery. Even some of the ones that had grown up in slavery and owned slaves 
abhorred it, hated it, and spent their lives trying to end the institution. Am I putting these guys, they're not angels, I'm not deifying them, I'm not putting them on a pedestal. I'm just telling you they were humans like us. And somehow, some way, God used these flawed men to put a document together that said we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Use those flawed men to put those principles in place, and it was those principles upon which Abraham Lincoln stood with the Emancipation Proclamation. It was those principles that Martin Luther King Jr. marched in the streets. He quoted from the Declaration almost as much as he quoted from the Bible. Those principles laid out the ideal of America, and ever since then we have constantly worked hard to become a more perfect union. And we've done that. We have become the most powerful, the wealthiest, the most free, and the most benevolent nation in the history of the world. But we don't know our history, and therefore we're buying the lies. We're buying the idea that somehow we should destroy America, that it's, it's not salvageable. That, that's what critical race theory is all about. It's creating this idea that America is so evil and so bad it must be destroyed. And that's why these kids are in the streets tearing down statues and tearing down the culture and rioting in that way. And a lot of them have a righteous indignation. They believe they're fighting for a good cause. They've been lied to. And we have truth, we have biblical truth that can teach people, depraved, yes, but the principles of God, the instruction manual of God when followed will bless even a flawed community and flawed men and women. That's what the American story is. I gotta tell you about a couple of these guys that we leave out of history. Peter Salem was a black patriot that fought at Bunker Hill and got 13 military commendations for what he did in that one day, one of the great military heroes in American history. James Armistead was our first Double agent. This was the James Bond of the Revolutionary War. This guy actually convinced the British that he was a runaway slave and that he hated the Americans and he wanted to beat the Americans. So he gets into their camp, gets up to the highest levels, gets all this great information, starts sneaking out, giving it to the uh, Lafayette and the Americans. We start using it to win some battles. As we start winning battles, the British are going, man, these Americans are getting smart. Say, so we need some spies to find out what they're doing. Who do we know that could go spy on those guys? We need it. Hey, Armistead, you'd be really good at this. Would you go spy on those Americans? No, I hate those Americans. No, we need you to go spy. No, I'm not going back. We really need. All right, I guess I could do that for you. <laughs> so now he's got, he's got free passage, right? So now he's, he's, he's getting the good stuff. He's taking it to Lafayette and the Americans, giving them all the good information. And they cook up a disinformation campaign. Go back, go back and give the disinformation campaign to the British. That guy right there sets up Yorktown. We end up ending the war because of what he did. We just don't talk about him anymore. Prince Whipple, Oliver Cromwell, black patriots that fought side by side with Washington throughout the Revolutionary War. Jump forward to the Civil War. These are all black patriots that got the Medal of Honor for protecting the American flag. This guy right here, William Carney, marched across that battlefield after the guy carrying the colors was killed. He took up the flag, did not let it touch the ground, was shot seven or eight times, and continued across that battlefield, refusing to give up the flag. And when he got to the other side, he said, I never let old glory touch the ground. They ended up writing a song about it. He got the Medal of Honor for it. Just phenomenal stories. Why? Now think about it. I mean, you think we got racial problems in America today. I mean, this was a civil war. This was when slavery still around. You talk about systemic racism. Absolutely there was systemic racism in the South at that time. But yet he still said that flag is the ideal of America. That flag stands for the value system that we're trying to achieve to, that was the mindset. I, you know, Alveda King probably taught me more about this than anybody. We were, we were, she's the um, niece of, of uh, MLK. Her dad was actually A.D. King. I don't know if you know MLK was actually a pastor, but uh, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and the Reverend A.D. King were known as the Sons of Thunder. And, and uh, she was, she were, this is the church where they all grew up and preached their first sermons and everything. And we did one of our Chasing American Legends episodes with Alveda, and we're standing, sitting there in a church, went to the Birmingham Civil Rights Museum. Went to, I got to see the cell from which MLK wrote the, the letter from the Birmingham jail. If you never read it, you need to read it. One of the greatest political works in American history. He didn't even have no research, nothing, no resources. He literally was writing on toilet paper and in the corners of magazines. So when you read that letter, you're going to go, how in the world? Did, I mean, supernatural what God did through him. Anyway, Alveda was just, she was telling us the story of their home getting burned, uh, bombed, and, and, uh, and, and the house catches on fire, and, and her dad, A.D., gets the kids, everybody out of the house. People start rioting in response to the, to the bombing, and he goes out, and he stands up on a car, and he gets everybody's attention, and he says, stop the violence. If you're going to hurt someone, hurt me. 
because we will never win with violence. We must win with peace. That's exactly what his brother MLK said all along. It's why they were able to change the world because of that peaceful message. But the part that stuck with me the most, I don't know if you can tell there in the church, my kids were all sitting down there on the first couple of rows and, and, uh, and Alvi just telling us all these stories and all of a sudden she stops, she looks at my kids and she goes, you know, we're, we're the same race. My kids are about as lily white as you can get, all right? She says, we're the same race. And we're, they're looking at her confused. I'm looking at her confused. And she goes, there's only one human race. And she said, I got white brothers and sisters. I got black brothers and sisters. I got red brothers and sisters. I said, man, that is, and then she literally, she said to us right then, she said, that was Uncle Martin's dream, that we would be judged by the content of our character, not the color of our skin. See, if we can get a hold of that, we can solve all this racial... I'm telling you, watch that episode, Chasing American Legends. It's called Communist King or Peaceful Crusader. People used to accuse MLK of being a, a communist. Absolutely not true, and we reveal all that in the, in the uh, episode, and it'll, it'll inspire you. But all of that to say, I was giving you some of those military heroes, Civil War and Revolutionary War. I just think it's important for us to recognize the freedom that we have comes at a cost. It, it, we're a little bit spoiled in America. I mean, let's admit it. We, we, we have all these blessings of liberty, and most of us have never had to pay a price for that. Others have paid that price. And so we've been given this freedom, and now the question is, what are we going to do with it? Are we going to be responsible with it? Are we going to actually live it out? The Bible tells us we should render honor unto whom honor is due. So whether it's our military veterans, our first responders, our, our police officers, all those people that put their lives on the line so that we can be free, part of how we honor them is actually living the freedom. Now think about what it says to a military veteran that was willing to go lay down their life, or someone that did die for our freedom, and then we don't even use our freedom. We don't even show up to vote. We don't even do the very thing they died to protect. See, we do the opposite whenever we actually follow what Abraham Lincoln said at the Gettysburg Address. He said, it's from these honored dead that we take an increased devotion to the cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. An increased devotion to the cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. Well, what's the cause for which they were willing to die? It's called American exceptionalism. It's the system. It's the, it's the political and economic structures. And, and some people don't like that term. They say, oh, Rick, you're bragging. Now, look, I'm a Texan. <laughs> we Texans know a little something about bragging. You know, I mean, we Texans tend to believe there's only two kinds of people in the world. There are Texans, and there are those that want to be Texans. That's it. <laughs> now, that is not a true statement, right? So that's bragging. My mom always said, though, if it's true, it ain't bragging. And when we say American exceptionalism, it's true. America is the exception to the rule. And actually, just to give you some proof that, that I'm not bragging here, this whole thing was created, this phrase was created by a Frenchman. <laughs> De Tocqueville's the one that came up with this idea. He saw what was happening in America. And so it, what it really means, exceptionalism, actually just means extraordinary. It means extraordinary, not ordinary, beyond ordinary, beyond normal. That's the story of America, and it's because of the principles, not even because of the people, but because of the principles that were put in place, and we've enjoyed the blessings of that. Here's the danger, here's where we are now. Uh, President Reagan said, if we forget what we did, we won't know who we are. He said, a warning of an eradication of the American memory that could result ultimately in an erosion of the American spirit. Are we experiencing that or not? Let's start with some basics, more attention to American history and a greater emphasis on civic Ritual. If we forget what we did, we won't know who we are. I would submit to you this morning that both the riots in the streets and the what I call COVID crackdowns, governors across the country acting like dictators and trying to control the movement and the, and the lives of every person in their state without constitutional authority, literally acting as dictators and emperors and empresses, I believe that both of those things are the result of the true pandemic which has been festering underneath for now five decades, civic ignorance. It's not an insult to our intelligence. It just means we don't know. We haven't been taught our true history, and we haven't been taught what is the formula that actually produces freedom. If you want freedom and liberty and prosperity and all those things on this side of the equation, you got to think about what are the inputs that produce those outputs, and what are the inputs that actually produce diversity, uh, not diversity, that, that produce division, 
that produce, um, uh, causing us to hate each other and causing us to fight. So what are we inputting on this side of the equation is gonna determine what we get on the other side of the equation. And we have to know where we came from in the first place to do this the right way. Mike Huckabee says it this way, history is to culture what memory is to an individual. Imagine being an individual who has lost his memory, who has amnesia, how confused, how disoriented everything is. It's the same with a culture that has lost its memory, its history. We've lost our history and therefore we're literally running, who are we, what do we really believe, what's worth fighting for, what is this nation all about? We've got to know our history, we've got to know where we came from. And obviously we don't have time to do a full blown history lesson this morning, but if you're questioning whether or not America's worth saving, let me give you one fact. Well first of all, just look at the last century, we saved the world from Nazism, communism, and despotism. So three times, our, our young men and women went around the world and laid down their lives for other nations to be free. And then this is the one fact, if you don't remember anything else, we're the only people on the face of the planet in the history of the world to hold a technological advantage in war and not use it to conquer our neighbors. Every time in history, if you got an advantage in war, what'd you do? You started conquering people, right? 1945, we have the bomb, no one else. We could have conquered the whole planet. We could have made every nation our slaves. Instead, we used that weapon to end the war, which saved millions of lives. Some of you may have been taught in school, we were evil for dropping the bomb. I have interviewed a lot of these World War II veterans on my radio program, and I've even interviewed guys that were on the Pacific Islands building the hospitals in preparation of a ground invasion of Japan, knowing if we had to invade on the ground, two million more casualties on our side, 20 million more casualties on their side. So Truman makes the impossible decision, drops the bombs, ends the war, and then we take our money and go rebuild the very nations that had attacked us. Who's ever done that in history? There is something different about the American value system, and it's the fact that it was based on biblical principles and the idea that our freedom does not come from each other, it comes from God, and we don't have the right to take it away from each other. We have a responsibility to export it to as many people as possible. That's the American mindset. So, thanks for that. I got to take a breath and a drink both. All right, so is America worth saving? Absolutely it is. Here's what you're saving. Okay, look, George Mason gave us kind of the formula that I want you to leave with this morning to understand what you're voting for when you vote and what you're fighting for when you become a, a citizen that's engaged. Uh, George Mason was one of the framers of the Constitution, 55 guys that gave it to us. He refused to sign the Constitution because it did not end slavery and because it did not have the Bill of Rights in it yet. So he was one of those guys trying to end it. Even though he was from a slave state of Virginia, he abhorred it, hated it, and wanted to end it. He also, his, that was one of his best contributions. One of his worst contributions, perhaps his worst contribution in all of history, is that he obviously gave us the mullet. If you see <clears throat> right there. You, uh, you thought it was Billy Ray Cyrus, but it, it wasn't. Long time ago, mullet came around. Anyway. Here's what he said, no free government. Anybody wanna live in freedom? All right, no free government, nor the blessings of liberty. Anybody want the blessings of liberty? He says nobody gets that, unless you have a frequent recurrence to fundamental principles. You will not preserve freedom for your children and grandchildren unless you have a frequent recurrence to fundamental principles. So we as citizens have a duty and a responsibility to come back and figure out what are the inputs. What are the principles that will produce liberty and prosperity and all those things that we desire? It's just like spring training. You can be the be one of the best athletes on the planet. You still go to spring training. You still go back and do ground balls. You still work on all the fundamentals every year so that you're prepared to be at your best. Same thing when it comes to freedom. We need more spring training for our freedom. We need to come back to those fundamental principles I was quoting for you just a few minutes ago out of the Declaration. And just remember, we don't get to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness unless we start with we hold these truths to be self-evident, moral absolutes, not moral relativism, truth. That means that when we're advocating for something, we gotta make sure it's true. We don't just jump on a bandwagon and start using slogans. We look at what is actually true. Because friend, I am not loving you if I'm lying to you. So if I'm lying to you about America's history, I'm not, in, I'm not loving you, I'm not being uh, uh, respectful of you. Truth is absolutely essential if you want this thing to survive. Father of the country said, of all the habits and dispositions which lead to political prosperity, that's a fancy way of saying of all the pieces of this input side that are important in terms of producing political prosperity, in other words, a, a, a society and a culture that, that is enjoying success, of all the pieces of that formula that are indispensable, it's religion and morality. 
You can't have liberty on this side of the equation if you don't have religion and morality on this side of the equation. And just think about that from a practical perspective. Without morality, how would you have liberty? If there's no morality, we can't even get to our car without being raped, murdered, stolen from, whatever it might be, right? The more you end up with no morality, the more crime, the more, the more uh, 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 all the, uh, the evils of society, and then government has to get bigger and bigger and bigger just to keep us from killing each other. So if you want liberty, you gotta have morality. Where do you get morality? From religion. That's what the father of the country is saying. He even goes so far as to say, in vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism that would work to subvert these great pillars. You say, Rick, wait, I can't be a patriot? If, I, if I'm trying to get rid of morality and get rid of, of religion and the culture? Yeah, if you're fighting to remove God from the public square, you're no patriot. You're actually undermining the very inputs and the very system that produce liberty. We have to have religion and morality. That's why religious liberty is so essential. That's why our church is being able to come together and meet and, 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 and worship is so essential because you're teaching people how to go back out into the culture and live in a way that will produce liberty. And by the way, the reason he said that is because he's watching the French Revolution. And the French are trying to get what we've got. And America's system is built on liberty from God, therefore uh, lived out respecting his authority. The French said, hey, we want the, the output, we want freedom, we want libertas, but they said we don't like the input. We don't want God, we don't want religion. So it led to total chaos, led to the guillotine, it did not work, and Washington's watching their experiment going, uh -huh, we don't want that. We don't want that result, therefore what's different about their input from our input, the difference is they remove God from the equation. We've got to use the instruction manual if we want it to survive. Keep God in the equation of freedom. Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration said, can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we remove their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God, that they're not to be violated but with his wrath. Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and his justice cannot sleep forever. You want liberty on the, on the output, you gotta keep God in the equation on the input. That's why we live out our freedom respecting his authority at last. That's what being salt and light's all about, friends. When you go out there in the culture and you're salt and light, you're the preservative, you're, you're literally bringing out the best flavor in the culture, that's what salt does. And so if, you, if you're doing that in your society and your, and your culture, then everybody benefits, not just us. We've got to be that city on a hill. We've gotta teach people how to obey all of those commands and the way that we do it right now, election year, not just election year, actually, throughout uh, every year, because you can still influence your government, not just when you vote, but also when your legislature's meeting, testif go testify, call your legislators, your local school board, your city councils. There's lots of ways to give or refuse consent, and it means being involved. I mean, voting's obviously one of those things and one of the things that we should talk more about, but uh, this president here, Garfield, 100 years ago, warned us about the moment we're in right now. We are literally the next centennial that he refers to. He says, now more than ever before, the people are responsible for the character of their Congress. He said, if that body be ignorant, reckless, and corrupt, it's because the people tolerate ignorance, recklessness, and corruption. He said, if it be intelligent, brave, and pure, it's because the people demand these high qualities to represent them in the national legislature. And I think that applies to your local legislature, to your school boards and city councils and everything else. He went on to say, if the next centennial does not find us a great nation, so that's us right now, we're the next centennial, it will be because those who represent the enterprise, the culture, and the morality of the nation, that's us right here, because we did not aid in controlling the political forces. Right back to that thing we started with, influencing the culture, being good citizens, living out our freedom, taking advantage of that talent that God's given us. So I'm literally gonna ask you to do exactly what the founding fathers did. They got up and, and on August 2nd to sign the Declaration of Independence, not July 4th, it was August 2nd, and they signed beneath that amazing final sentence that says, in support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. I'm asking you to do the same. Not all of it, you don't have to give everything, but I'm asking you to give a little bit of your life, become a student of freedom, start spending an hour or two a week studying what freedom is all about. It's not enough to wave the flag, we gotta know why the American flag is worthy of being waved. What does it stand for? What is this value system? So become a student of freedom, an informed citizen. Don't be like most people who can't name the freedoms, don't even know the three branches of government. We teach it in Independence Hall. So we do a Constitution class where we actually take you into the room where the Declaration and the Constitution were done. 
Uh, Scott and Elena are going to do this January. Is that what y'all are thinking about? January, we'll be doing Constitution classes that you can attend right here with the, at the church. It's a great way to get involved. We've got 3,000 Constitution coaches across the country teaching a biblical worldview of government right now using our Constitution class. 125,000 people have gone through it. We want 3 million to go through it in the next three or four years. You got, in fact, we're doing the largest Constitution class in history on Monday nights right now. i got 11,000 people online doing that class with me. So it's only going to grow. We make it fun. I don't know about you, but I learned history in uh, high school and college like this. <laughs> Drool all over my desk. I mean, it was boring. I was asleep. We don't do that, all right? We make it fun and exciting. We write books and, and do all of our videos in that way. So check some of that stuff out there. Um, let me just beg you, <laughs> not just ask you, but beg you, vote. Let your voice be heard. Make sure your values are being counted and that your values are not Republican or Democrat. They are biblical values, right? Make sure you're not voting party or personality, but you're voting principles. When you elect someone, you're not electing their personality. You're electing the policies that they're going to put in place. For instance, when you elect a president, 4,000 appointments that's what, you're, that's what you're voting for, 4,000 appointments over a period of four years. So you're electing all of that team, if you will, and the policies that are, they're going to put in place. And in a smaller way, the same thing with your state legislature and right on down the line. Uh, don't buy this idea of your vote doesn't count. It's not going to make a difference, okay? Every vote counts. Listen, I lost my first race for the legislature by 20 votes out of 30,000. Now, I don't know about in California, but 20 votes in Texas that's just one average size homeschool family. That's it. One family. We could have won that race. Now, we, we had a recount, and I won the recount by 36 votes. So I lost by 20, then I won by 36. We found some hanging chads, for those of you that remember Florida. George Bush was governor of Texas, 1998, when this happened. He calls me right after the recount, and he says, he says boy, that was close. He said, I'm officially dubbing you landslide green. <laughs> he laughed. thought that was real funny in 98. 2000, little recount in Florida, and the President of the United States wins by 537 votes. Every vote counts, all right? Make sure that you show up and vote. And don't do this whole thing of, Rick, I'd vote, but, you know, I will not vote for the lesser of two evils. All right, well, listen. Unless Jesus Christ is on the ballot, you will vote for the lesser of two evils. I'm just saying, don't shoot the messenger. There is none righteous, no, not one, right? We are all flawed jars of clay, and you got to look at them and go, okay, which one is most biblical in their policies? Maybe not even some of the things they've done in their own life that we read about in the paper, right? But which one is actually implementing the most biblical policies and getting us in that direction? So don't get hung up on personality. Look for the policies. That's the way you got to do it. Make sure your vote's counting. Be a force multiplier. Tell other people. Uh, you can influence, and, 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 and a lot of people don't know who they're going to vote for. So when you share on Facebook and you share truth, you're standing up. You're, you're actually giving your life, your fortune, your sacred honor is speaking truth even when it's not popular. And we need more Christians willing to do that. Let me leave you with this quote by Noah Webster. He said, when you become, we started with him, we'll end with him. He said, when you become entitled to exercise the right of voting for public officers, let it be impressed on your mind that God commands for you to choose for your rulers just men who will rule in the fear of God. The preservation of our government depends on the faithful discharge of this duty. If the citizens neglect their duty and place unprincipled men in office, the government will soon be corrupted Laws will be made not for the public good so much as for selfish or local purposes. Corrupt or incompetent men will be appointed to execute the laws. The public revenues will be squandered on, it's starting to sound like a prophecy out there, right? On unworthy men and the rights of the citizens will be violated or disregarded. If our government fails to secure public prosperity and happiness, it must be because the citizens neglect the divine commands and elect bad men to make and administer the laws. Bottom line, it's our responsibility. The burden is on us. We've got to do our duty, and that means giving of our life, our time, studying, making sure we know who the candidates are, telling other people about it, showing up to vote, studying the Constitution, all those things. Our fortunes, yeah, I'm going to ask you to donate to good causes out there, to good candidates, and start giving more to your church. And here's why. Not, nobody asked me to say that. If the church is the epicenter of the community the way it was in the early part of our nation's history, government doesn't have to be as big. If the church is able to, to serve the needs of the community, you don't need all these government programs. And no person's life is gonna be improved by a check from the government. 
But when the church is able to reach out and help and actually build a relationship, that's when lives are changed. And that's the way our system was designed. So every time you donate to your church, not just tithes, but above and beyond that, every time you create a program in your church to reach out to the community, you're doing the biblical model of how we should take care of the poor. The Bible does not say for government to take care of the poor. It says for us to take care of the poor. So anyway, so do all, all of those things. Uh, make sure that you're involved. Listen to our radio program. We're really optimistic. We're not going to be like some people, you know, it's all over. Grab your guns and canned food. Go hide out. There's depressing people out there. That's not us, all right? We're Joshua and Caleb style. We believe we can take the mountain, and we want you to do the same. Uh, so invest in freedom. Invest in your local church. Invest in individual lives. We can save this thing if we'll just do our part. If we'll get involved. We'll stand up and say, here I am, Lord. Use me. Give me discernment. Help me be an influence, a positive influence on the people around me. Help me take the instruction manual and actually apply it to every single area of my, of my life. Our nation needs you. I am so proud of Awakened Church. You guys, I said it earlier, you really are a beacon. People are watching what you're doing right now. You're being an influence on not only your whole state here in California, but people all over the nation and all over the world. So I'm so thankful for your leadership uh, at this church, having the wisdom and the discernment to not put Christ in a box and, and, and leave this stuff out, to have the wisdom and discernment to question some of the things that are happening that might be popular and kind of faddish out there, even in the evangelical church, and say, wait a minute, we're going to stay biblical. We're not just going to put our finger to the wind. We're going to make sure this, this is biblical. Friends, that is rare right now. There's a winnowing happening in the church. I'm so thankful for what your leadership is doing right here. God bless you guys. I mean, it's almost like being in Texas or something. Um, anyway. God's using California in a mighty way. God bless you guys. Thanks for listening. To find out more about our locations, team, and what we do here at Awakened Church, go to awakenedchurch.com.